I'm really excited to introduce our moderator tonight. Um, I met him like a week ago and we were talking about this event and he had already so many smart things to say about it that I was like, you should moderate this. <laughs> so I'm really proud to introduce um, Harris Chaudhry. Um, he's a student of political economy working between activism, architecture, and contemporary art. He's based in Dallas, Texas, and has worked, studied, and organized in Lahore, Mexico City, and Johannesburg. Um, he has shown his sculptural works as part of a group and solo shows in Mexico, Texas, New York, and part of the inaugural Lahore Biennial. Um, and he'll be introducing our presenters tonight and moderating, uh, moderating the discussion. So give him a warm welcome. Thanks so much. Thank you all so much uh, for being here. I wanted to first introduce our first speaker, Morshin Aliyari, who is an artist, activist, educator, and occasional curator. She's the recipient of the Leading Global Thinkers of 2016 Award by Foreign Policy Magazine. Morshin was born and raised in Iran and moved to the United States in 2007. She thinks about technology as a philosophical tool set to reflect on objects and as a poetic means to document our personal and collective lives, struggles in the 21st century. Uh, Morshin has been part of numerous exhibitions, festivals, and workshops around the world, including the Venice Biennale of Architecture, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Montreal, uh, the Tate Modern, the Queens Museum, Pori Museum, uh, and her work has been featured in the New York Times, the Huffington Post, Wired, National Public Radio, Freeze, Hyperallergic, um, and many others. So I'd like you to give a warm welcome to Morishin. Hello, I'm not Justice. <clears throat> Thanks for being here and uh, for having me. Let me see if this works first. Am I... On. Yes. All right. So um, this is ten minutes of talk. So I have to like really bring everything to like a very I guess like simple, brief way of talking about it. But I'm happy to expand on um, some of these concepts when we are um, talking more during our panel. Um, so I also have chosen to only focus on one body of work that I'm currently working on called "She Who Sees the Unknown." Uh, which is um, a research-based project. Um, and I started to work on this project after a work that I finished um, in 2016 called Material Speculation Isis, where I reconstructed some of the artifacts um, uh, and 3D printed them and did a lot of research around them that were destroyed by Isis at Mosul Museum in, in Iraq in 2015. And so this project in some ways is a respond to that, if, if, if uh, material speculation ISIS was about reconstructing memories that were lost and artifacts that were destroyed, um, she who sees the unknown is about reimagining the possibilities um, of the past, reimagining the past and histories as ways to reimagining present and the future. Um, and I think this project really came together for me um, also like due to a lot of like events and things that has been happening um, you know with Muslim ban and uh, the um, you know all, all these things around the rejected ban bodies of, of the people from the Middle East so um, I am gonna explain this a little bit so she who is the unknown is about um, doing research um, around monstrous dark goddess um, gen or genie female figures all coming from the Middle East. So I go back and look at these misrepresented, forgotten histories. Um, and these figures, these figures, um, a lot of them um, are you know, not talked about. Like when you think about superheroes, right, it's always like very much male. And it's, it's the same thing in the West. But also when you look at a lot of these like mythical narratives and stories, a lot of them you know, from like 600 years ago to let's say like 1400, 1500 years ago. Um, and you look at these stories and you see that um, all, all these characters that stay or are like talked about are like very much only, only men. I wanted to go back and find these female figures, the, these dark goddess female figures that have sort of this notion of monstrosity with them. And I'll explain that in, in a second, why monstrosity. Um, and to uh, think about this idea of refiguring, refiguring as this practice of activism and feminism and decolonizing. Um, but not only just refiguring 
literally their figures, refiguring their like aesthetic, um, but also refiguring their stories. So this project has, I would say, two main components to it. One is um, this idea, like practical idea of like building an archive around these uh, these figures and the stories of these uh, female or sometimes uh, like genderless queer figures, um, because. We don't have the, like an archive like this that is like specifically focused on on these figures, uh, you know, coming from the Middle East. So I really want to build this archive, um, and part of it is having a reading room as part of the exhibition, when the audience can spend a lot of time with this material. Um, and as I mentioned, this project is very research based. Um, so this makes a lot of sense, but also uh, by the time this project is done, uh, I want to give also open access to a lot of this material that I'm gathering. A lot of um, PDF files, text, images, um, mostly in, in Farsi and, and Arabic, um, that I think it would be nice to bring them together. Um, and then it also, I'm gonna show you, this is like the example of the reading room that I set up. Um, and so, like, how basically through these ideas of poetic uh, speculative storytelling, reappropriation of traditional, um, you know, methodologies, collaging, meshing, etc., um, I can bring these things together. But I also use 3D printing and 3D scanning as my main um, tools for investigation. And I also like bring together different um, artists, activists, writers, etc. sometimes even scientists uh, from all you know, um, different parts of the Middle East to participate um, in these uh, events that are called refiguring. And this is more of the now conceptual part where I create sculptural figures out of, out of these um, you know, different, different monstrous figures. So the idea is that by the end of this research, which hopefully will be the end of 2018, I will have sort of an army of these dark goddess monstrous figures, and each of them will have their own power, they will have their own stories. Um, but when I talk about refiguring, I'm also really interested um, in this notion of how through going back and finding these, these figures, we can use their power, whatever it is that they're known for, um, as a way to turn it around against different powers that oppresses us or like um, di different forms of colonialism. So this project is about embracing monstrosity. There's a long history of feminism and monstrosity, you know, with um, people like Rosie Bray Doty or um, Donna Haraway, but, um, Rather than pushing that away, how we can like use that again as a way to challenge different power structures. So, because the time is very short, I'm just going to choose one of these stories to tell you. The rest are um, on my website. The videos are on my website, and if you want the password, I can give that to you if you email me. Um, this is. I'm just going to go through it and say that this is a gen. Her name is Huma. She brings fever to human body. Um, and also for me, Jen or Jeannie as a figure is um, a figure that I think there's like a lot of potential into exploring it. So for those of you who might not know, um, Jen or Jeannie are figures that are talked about in the Quran, but also growing up in Iran or in a lot of other Islamic cultures, they're very much part of our cultures. I, I remember my grandmother telling me um, stories about Jen uh, or like how a lot of people in her village talked about seeing this gen in their public bathroom um, um, out of the, the, the public, no, I'm sorry, like public bath of, of their village. So it's a, it's a figure that is very much part of, um, I guess, our culture, right? And I really wanted to bring this back as something that uh, we can explore and, and talk about. Um, this is Aisha Kandisha. And um, she is a Moroccan gen, and we, when she possesses human, she literally creates a crack on the on the human body, and the crack opens humans into this incoming data of other demons and jinn. And the only way to to not go insane when she when when you get possessed by her is to participate with her. So again, you can imagine the potential is like of of like how this this figure can be used as a way again to talk about. Um, different forms of oppression. And so, yeah, I'm, I write new stories for each of them. And again, that's, that takes different forms. This is the one I want to like, talk about a little bit more. And this is, uh, these are figures, um, I mean, um, they're called Ya'juj Majuj, and they're talked about in the Quran. 
Um, and the stories that they represent chaos. There are figures that represent chaos, and, and um, an iron wall gets built to keep them out. So when I was doing this research, um, I, I, you know, I started in 2016, and I had left the US to go to um, Berlin for a festival that I was giving a talk for. And I've lived in the US for 10 years, um, and when I was there, the Muslim ban happened. And if you remember, at the very beginning of the ban, green card holders were also like included in the ban. So, and I had my Iranian passport, and that meant that I couldn't come back to the US. And it was like a very um, complicated moment for me because I also can't really go back to Iran. I've done like a lot of like work that, that is like also political. And it felt like everything that I have built in, in, in the last 10 years of my life could basically go back to, to zero, you know? And it was like a very difficult time, but I also had the privilege of having the green card to be able to come back. And when I came back, I was doing research and I came across this story of Yajuj Majuj. And one thing that I was like very inspired by with this story um, is that this, this, this thing that would, would happen when you know, uh, the Muslim ban happened, and like, even on my own social media, when I had like, said that I can't come back, people kept on like, saying things like, oh, but you're so inspiring, you're so successful, like, they should like, you know, welcome you here, why can't you like, come back, um, etc. And I think for me, that, was such, that is such a dangerous um, you know, argument. You don't have to be inspiring or successful to, to live somewhere. It, you know, it's like you have a right to live somewhere without, without being successful or inspiring. Um, so, you know, and this is when I talk about this embracing of monstrosity as something that I'm interested in. Uh, that rather than being like, no, we're good people, like, let us come in, um, using this monstrosity as a concept, as a poetic, as a way to then talk about how you become the monster and how through histories different people have become othered and monstrous as a way to, be, to get you know, justified um, being banned or like rejected um, or, or killed. So you know, the story of Yajuj Majud goes back and forth uh, uh, between the people who ask them to be uh, walled out and they, they change uh, and shift roles um, and again, please feel free to watch it. Um, and the way I, I created these stuff is also, the process is that I go and find these old illustrations from different books, um, again, like older material, and I reappropriate them, I 3D model them, I 3D print what I you know, model, and then I scan them. So, and then I use this like, scanning data as a way for you know, telling their stories or making a VR piece. Um, Etc. So this is their sculptures. Um, and I want to just finish with this slide. But I also gonna before I finish this, I'm gonna say that I also just finished a new um, figure, which is the story of the laughing snake. And that is a, a project that is co-commissioned by Whitney Museum and a Liverpool Biennial, and it's gonna come up on July 12th. So look for that one. It's a net art web art piece. So it's very different than just video. Um, just one channel of like storytelling, um, and then this is the quote. This is a quote that gets used when the story of the yeah, Ajuj Majuj is told in the Quran, which is when they break through this wall, there will be the end of days, and it doesn't say the end of time, and it doesn't say the end of world. And I think there is so much poetic and beauty in this concept of the end of day because it promises another kind of tomorrow, right? It's not just like this dark dystopian end, but rather another kind of tomorrow. And so I think a lot of the work that I do is about that, building other kind of presence and futures, alternative futures, um, as a way to yeah, live in another kind of tomorrow. So thank you. Thank you so much, Morishin, for that presentation. Um, our next presenter uh, will be Ruby Lal. She'll be reading from her new text, um, which will be for sale after this event um, in the back. But Ruby Lal is a professor of South Asian studies at Emory University. She holds a doctor in philosophy uh, in modern history from the University of Oxford and uh, an M philosophy in history from the University of Delhi. She's taught at the Johns Hopkins University in history and anthropology and served as the associate director for the program um, for, of women and gender studies and sexuality. Um, her current creative nonfiction work is a narrative history of Mughal Empress Nur Jahan, Empress the Astonishing Reign of Nur Jahan. Uh, she's also the author of two previous books, 
domesticity and power in the early Mughal, Mughal world, as well as coming of age in 19th century India, the girl child and the art of playfulness, uh, which were both reviewed widely in academic journals and magazines. Her short stories have appeared in Indian literature and in the Little Magazine. She is currently revising her short story collection, Rubble and Other Stories. So please welcome Ruby Lal. of adjustment. Thank you for having me. Um, my publicist said I must do this, so I'm going to do this. Empress, the astonishing reign of Noor Jahan came out five days ago. Um, thank you. Um, actually, thank you for doing that, because um, this is a Muslim empress of India. And to write about the great Muslim empress of India uh, under the current uh, Hindu right-wing nonsense that's going on um, is something I'm very proud of. Um, I'm going to read a selection. I have 10 minutes. Um, and the selection in order to entice you to ask me more questions. Um, I'll end the selection with a question. In the autumn of 1619, when the days were clear and cool, perfect for travel, the royal cavalcade of Emperor Jahangir and Empress Noor Jahan, his 20th and favorite wife, set out from Agra, the capital of Mughal India. They were headed for the Himalayan foothills. The people of Mathura, a popular pilgrimage site along the Empress route, were anxious for his arrival. For months, a tiger had been attacking villagers and visitors, then disappearing into the forest, evading local hunters. No divine intervention seemed to be coming from Lord Krishna and his consort Radha, the Hindu deities worshipped in Mathura's temples. But the emperor could solve the problem. Killing tigers had long been a royal prerogative. Jahangir, his name meant conqueror of the world in Persian, the language of the court, and he was the fourth Mughal emperor, a Muslim dynasty that was established early in the 16th century. Descendants of the Central Asian nomad kings, Chengiz, uh, Chengiz Khan and Timur, the Mughals ruled much of Hindu-majority India for more than 300 years. According to one excited observer, the imperial procession included 1,500,000 people, men, women and children, courtiers, soldiers and servants, along with 10,000 elephants and a great deal of artillery. The procession halted near Mathura and attendants began erecting hundreds of magnificent tents and the harem quarters marked with intricately carved red screens. While the traveling court was still being set up, a group of local huntsmen appeared and begged Jahangir to do something about the tiger. Unfortunately, the emperor was obliged to decline. Several years before, Jahangir had taken a vow to give up hunting when he turned 50. After that, he had promised Allah he would injure no living being with his own hands. He was two months past that milestone birthday and had recently renewed the vow as an offering on behalf of a favorite four-year-old grandson traveling with him who suffered from epilepsy. Shooting a tiger was now out of the question for Jahangir. The empress, however, was there to protect her subjects. Beautiful and accomplished, Noor Jahan was the daughter of nobles who had fled persecution in Iran. She was also the widow of a court official implicated in a plot against the emperor. But that didn't stop Jahangir for, from falling hard for her. She was 34 when they married, nearly middle-aged in the Mughal world. Since their wedding in 1611, the same year that Shakespeare premiered The Tempest, Noor Jahan, light of the world in Persian, the name that her husband gave her, had proved to be a devoted wife, a wise and just queen, a shrewd politician, and an expert markswoman. Her shooting skills were already legendary. A few years earlier, she had amazed her husband and his courtiers by slaying four tigers with only six shots. So on October 23, 1619, 
Noor Jahan mounted an elephant and settled into the howdah, the elaborate litter on the animal's back holding a musket. The mahout, the elephant handler, led her along the sandy track towards the forest. Noor Jahan accompanied her husband Jahangir on his own elephant, and they were followed by a long line of courtiers, some on superbly ornamented elephants and horses, and other in red and gold jeweled palanquins with silken seats, decorated with garlands of flowers and carried by attendants. Portraits of Noor Jahan from the period suggest that she was wearing a regal turban, much like the ones favored by the emperor and distinguished nobleman, but highly unusual for a woman a knee-length tunic and a sash around the waist over tight trousers, and earrings and necklace of rubies, diamonds, or pearls. Her shoes were open at the back, exposing the henna designs on her feet. At, her, at, at 42, she was still praised by her contemporaries for her luminous beauty. Local hunters on the foot guided the party past fields of barley, peas, and cotton, lush from the recent rains. Along the way, they spotted herds of cattle, goats, and black buck with long corkscrew horns. When they reached the forest, the emperor and the empress could barely see beyond the dense wall of creepers, bushes, and trees, lofty Neem, Thorny Babool, and many others. The hunters showed the empress and her retinue the spot where the tiger was likely to appear, and they waited. Soon, Noor's elephant in the lead began groaning and stepping nervously from side to side. The mahout couldn't make it stand still, and Noor Jahan's howdah lurched precariously. From his own elephant, Jahangir looked on, silent and focused. Later, he would recall the moment in the Jahangir Nama, the memoirs of Jahangir, a journal that he began when he ascended the throne in 1605, and this memoir would serve as the public record of his reign. An elephant is not at ease when it smells a tiger and is constantly in movement, he wrote and to hit with a gun from a litter is a very difficult matter. The tiger emerged from the trees, Noor lifted her musket, aimed between the animal's eyes and pulled the trigger. Despite the swaying of the elephant, one shot was enough, the tiger fell to the ground, killed instantly. Jahangir was delighted. A woman shooting publicly was rare, a woman shooting with such expertise was unheard of. So Noor's shooting skill wasn't the only thing that made her highly unusual. She held a position in the empire never before filled by a woman, co-sovereign. For more than a decade and a half, from a few years after their wedding until Jahangir's reign, Noor Jahan ruled with her husband effectively and prominently, successfully navigating the labyrinth of feudal courtly politics and the male-centered culture of the Mughal world. She issued her own imperial orders and coins of the realm bore her name along with her husband. In Islamic thought and practice, the edicts and the coins were convincing technical signs of sovereignty. Furthermore, Noor sat where no other Mughal queen had sat before or would after, in the Jharokha, an elaborately carved balcony projecting from the palace wall from which government business was conducted. Subjects gathered below the Jharokha to, play, to pray for her health. Nobles sometimes presented themselves below the imperial balcony, and according to the paymaster historian, a contemporary historian, and listened to her dictates. He wrote further, at last her authority reached such a pass that the king was such only in name. Repeatedly he gave out that he bestowed the, the sovereignty on Noor Jahan Begum. A generation earlier, Jahangir's father, Akbar the Great, Noor's father-in-law, had ordered all royal women, wives, daughters, and concubines to be sequestered behind harem walls. He called them the veiled ones. But three decades after Akbar's dictate, Noor Jahan was on view in the most male and public of spaces. A new kind of power was on display. Noor Jahan, I'm making this claim, hasn't been made before. Noor Jahan was the only woman ruler in the long dynasty of India's great Mughals. How did she do it in that time and that place? How did the emperor's extraordinary strengths, the emperor's lamentable weaknesses, the twists and turns of 17th century politics, and the power of their love 
combined to define a time and culture that ought to have made the reign of Noor Jahan impossible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruby, for that reading. Um, our last presenter, and then we'll move into our conversation portion, will be uh, Shazia Sekander. Born in Lahore, Pakistan in 1969, Shazia Sekander earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts in 1991 from the National College of Arts in Lahore, where she received training in miniature painting. She became the first woman to teach in the department, um, later challenging the medium's technical and aesthetic framework um, while she was teaching there. Sekander's breakthrough work received national acclaim in Pakistan, winning the NCA's Highest Merit Award. Uh, and going on to receive national critical acclaim, subsequently launching, launching the medium to the forefront of not only NCA's program, um, but also within contemporary art practices across the world. Um, Shazia moved to the United States to pursue an MFA at the Rhode Island School of Design, uh, then participating in a number of residencies across the country. Her pioneering practice takes classical Indo-Persian miniature painting as its point of departure and challenges uh, the formal tropes of the genre by experimenting with scale and various forms of new media. Informed by South Asian, American, feminist, and Muslim perspectives, uh, Sikandar has developed a unique and critically charged approach to the medium, uh, interrogating ideas of language, trade, and empire, and migration. A recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship in 2006 and the State Department Medal of Arts in 2012, Sikandar has been the subject of many major international exhibitions, recently including Maxi Museum in Rome, uh, the Asia Society Hong Kong Center, and the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao in 2015. So please welcome Shazia Sekander. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm going to use my 10 minutes to the max. I have a lot of images, but I need the clicker. Thank you. So yes, yeah, so I work across a lot of different mediums, drawings, digital animation, video, large scale murals, glass, permanent public artworks. Through my creative process of almost three decades, I have also been able to cultivate a creative space for historical Indo-Persian miniature painting, a genre often considered too traditional for contemporary expression. When I first started to research and deconstruct miniature painting in Lahore, Pakistan in the mid-late 80s, it was then largely unknown to the global contemporary art world as the Euro-American canon dominated the field of painting. I was born in Lahore, Pakistan, to a family of storytellers. My first memory is of my father reading to me Korni Tchaikovsky's book, Unusual Tales, translated into Urdu. His creative freedom in customizing the tales as he read out loud was infectious and entertaining. It signaled to me as a young child to be inventive. But growing up in Pakistan in the 1980s, under a military regime that incessantly institutionalized religion was a deeply conflicting experience. The diminishing women's rights, emerging blasphemy laws, the polarized public-private spaces, discouraged dissent, and creative expression. I was inspired by women leaders like the late Asma Jangir, the human rights activist, as well as the late visual artist Lala Rukh, who was a founding member of the Women Action Forum. Being a part of WAF gave me substantial insight into women's rights and issues, as well as a broader grasp on the intersections of community and art. As a transnational, a Pakistani, a Pakistani American, a woman, now an older woman artist, a Muslim woman, an Asian, an Asian American, and so forth, there are plenty of categories around. Complex and nuanced art that does not fit in any dominant narratives gets marginalized regardless. Contemporary Islamic art itself is a revolving category. I have learned that categories are inevitable. The real issue is how to how the work navigates the various categories over time. 
This brings me to one, um, I want to talk about this particular work, The Red Lotus. It's a comment on the trope of ideal love as a stock motif in miniature painting. Here the reference is to the celebrated folk love story of Baz Bahadur and Rukmati, whose love was lost in war from within the miniature vernacular. My interpretation of the stock characters is meant as a site of rupture to destabilize the motif of heterosexual love itself. The image is further dismantled by the breakdown of the surface plane into numerous pieces, challenging the iconography of the miniature is the technique and process of recreating through broken glass. So um, my work started to breach national boundaries, to dismantle control over women bodies in visual and national representations. Isma Chuktai, Kishwar Nahid started conversing with Fatima Marnisi, Bell Hooks, Helen Susu, as I started to manipulate the established forms and pictorial conventions of miniature paintings further. Decolonizing also meant to locate context and intimacy across race and sexuality. By dislocating traditional framing devices of center and margin within miniature painting, I could open up the narratives of gender and sexuality. The work was, often the works were comments on paradoxes and polarities, hierarchies via underrepresented female accounts, whether in art, culture, religion, or the political discourse. The female forms became uniquely personal too, as in the image of self-nourishing, often uprooted figure, female figures which refused to belong, to be fixed, to be grounded, to be stereotyped. Pleasure Pillars explores my interest in cultural semiotics, including, including Hindu and Muslim iconographies and in juxtaposing anti-classical impulses in Western art, such as mannerism, with a variety of outsider aesthetics, such as the Indian aesthetic, within the 19th century European scholarship. As the works, um, one of the works that I wanted to show was actually a piece that I did for New York Times Magazine in September of 1999. It was um, for the millenn Millennium Issue um, by um, a re reimagined, like the Millennium, scenes from the Millennium reimagined by living artists. So the work highlights um, the interface of American policy in Islamic countries. So my painting was done almost 20 years ago. So what I found interesting is that this work was made then, but is as relevant now, or perhaps even more relevant. And it was only reviewed in 2017 when it was on view at the Asia Society in New York as part of Lucid Dreams and Distant Visions, South Asian Art in the Diaspora, where the, uh, it was called prescient as well as an American masterpiece. So that type of interest in how work gets contextualized is, is obviously um, part of, of what I have made, including this other work, Utopia. It resurfaced um, on the cover of Brooklyn Rail during November of 2016. So um, in general, I think I'm interested um, in, of course, using illuminated manuscripts, Islamic arts, with also um, cutting-edge technologies and to engage pop culture as well as history. One of the uh, works here is um, Ecstasy is Sublime, Heart is Vexter, inspired in part by Princeton University Library's late 16th century manuscript known as the Peksha Nami, an archetype of the 10th century epic poem. These works that I've created, which are permanent, are in glass, stone, and they consider historical figures, spiritual events, images of flight, descent, material economy, to invite contemplation and conversation through um, permanent artworks that were born, that, are, that will remain part of the economics building at Princeton. So one of the uh, works that, that is in there is also, um, that is, it's about the motif of mirage is heavily present, but in, outside of that, the image that I wanted to focus on was on Adam Smith, the economist, philosopher, author of The Wealth of no Nations, who argues against monopolies using the demise of the East India Company as a case study. So we are still caught in the same old patterns 
of inequity of wealth. So for my depiction of Adam Smith, I fashioned him in the company school of miniature painting that emerged under the colonial rule. In the economics building at Princeton University, Adam Smith is strapped in company attire. His lofty ideas have grown wings, but he is only fluttering. He is not able to fly. So I was also reading Nick Robbins, the author of The Corporation That Changed the World, How the East India Company Shaped the Modern Multinational, who describes the East India Company's story as a tragedy, enormous wealth generated through great harm. So for me, collaboration, incredibly instrumental. Um, these are also images of animations I've done. I work with writers, composers, musicians, performance artists. artists. So while I was working on this particular animation, The Last Post, which can be seen as a metaphor for societies in flux, I, um, it allowed me to take my interest in the colonial history of the subcontinent as well and then engage, um, uh, create protagonists, such as the East India Company man itself, who appears in various guises throughout the piece, often as a lurking threat in the imperial rooms of the Mughal Empire. I worked with um, Duyan, who won a Pulitzer last, um, last year in music. And I've been working with her for almost a decade. And we also worked um, recently in Pakistan at the Lahore um, Art Biennial. So collaboration is um, critical in the practice. You can, um, the, there's scores done with different people. Uh, this particular work is from um, works that I did in Istanbul as well as the Sharjah Art Foundation. Parallax, which, uh, which, is, uh, which was done for Sharjah Biennial. The work here examines contested histories of colonialism, mechanisms of power, cultural authority, tensions over the control of Strait of Hormuz in the Persian Gulf, maritime trade, movement of resources and commodities such as bodies and oil, naval warfare, imperial air, la land travel routes, they all underlie this particular um, work. So the, uh, the way I work is I'll draw and then the motifs that I reimagine can be born differently, code written, and then through movement and animation, they, they gain different uh, meanings and trenchant historical symbols can be given shifting identities. Velocity, magnitude, direction, they all become essential aspects in creating time. The audience is no longer limited to the museum. Like this particular walk, where, which was in Times Square, and here the, the Gopi contagion is born from um, elements of women hair, which um, the single unit of the female hair silhouette, as you can see here in the painting itself, has tremendous possibilities. At once singular and representational, when reproduced and choreographed in the millions as moving images, it oscillates between several multiple representations. So what emerged in, uh, in timescale was the kinetic thrust, the enormous energy charge of the motif of the hair, to occupy a space beyond the archives so that the story itself is free to witness its own history and empower its own narrative, functioning as a force, an engine for survival. So this particular reference to Sufi enlightenment and Hindu devotional bhakti was further explored through taking the female hair form as well as the wings choreographed as particle systems from the mirage angels and while engaging with, with the theme of strife and struggle for truth through a work that was called Disruption as Rapture. And I'm going to show a few images of that and show a clip of the piece itself. So the work is, uh, born, on, uh, is born from Gulchane Ishq, an epic poem um, written by Nusrati in Dakani Urdu for, um, in the language of Muslim elite in South Central India. Um, the Poet recounts the tale of connection, separation, longing, final union of lovers by creating a world full of lush gardens and magical beings, where the love story emerges as a metaphor for a soul search and connection with the divine. So I, it's, I created a reinterpretation of it, but when the Philadelphia Museum of Art reached out to me 
to develop this work, I've, my interest was in the provenance. I began by analyzing who and what was this manuscript, who had commissioned it, who had painted it, who had written it, how did it come to the uh, museum itself, and if it was made under Islamic patronage in central India, was it Islamic art or was it South Asian art? And this occupies these such questions occupy me, because historically the movement of objects and bodies, such as in trade, slavery, migration, and colonial occupation, has forced meaning to shift and oscillate with every generation. Our histories are about redaction. As an artist, imagination is very much about taking ownership of those contested narratives. And it is that, that manner for me in terms of taking this um, creating the link with the past to current and to the future is, becomes almost a fundamentally political stance. So who gets to define the other in the collective imaginary? Whose histories are being determined by those in positions of power, whether colonial, imperial, or nationalistic narratives? So if there is time, can we show like a minute and a half?
So we'll now invite our guests to the stage for um, a little bit of a conversation. And then um, we'll have a chance as well at the end for some questions uh, from folks in the audience. Thank you so much to the three of you for <laughs> your respective presentations. Um, I think for me, the thing that um, sort of jumps out immediately as a connection through all of your practices um, is, a, is a wrestling with destruction, dissection, uh, and the aftermath of these processes. So I'm, I'm very interested in how all of you think about reconstruction and reconceptualization and the aftermath of the major upheavals, revolutions, and historical events that you sort of center in your practices. Um, so basically, I guess my question is almost, I mean, what is one to do after the explosion? Should I begin? <laughs> um, I think for me, um, the question you're asking is a question about silence in some, in some senses. Silence that's, uh, you know, very pervasive in history. Um, I'll speak as a, um, as a historian here and as uh, somebody who's written um, for a long time uh, accounts that have been completely wiped out of history. Uh, the question of evidence is one that's often posed to historians, but particu particularly to feminist historians. The question often is, uh, how are you going to do this, that, and the other history? There are no sources for it. I was asked this question when I wrote my first book. Um, and, um, uh, you know, this, the, the, that book was about the uh, ancestors of Noor Jahan, if you will, so just before her. Um, and I centered um, a very famous memoirist, the only woman who wrote uh, a, a beautiful account in prose uh, from the entire Islamic world of that time, a woman called Gulbadan Banu Begum. She was the daughter of Babur, sister of Humayun and aunt of Akbar the Great. So something quietened after that, um, after that book. And, uh, you know, my approach was taken seriously. Here, the, uh, the, the, the points are really quite extraordinary. Noor Jahan has several of us know is a household name in, in South Asia. Uh, but the way she's remembered is in two ways. One is often a love story, which is, um, there are many versions of that love story of Jahangir and Noor meeting, falling in love. Um, there are sometimes pigeons at play in the love story. Um, uh, she's, she's standing there holding two pigeons uh, and Jahangir as young prince goes by and he looks at this woman and says, I have to pluck up pluck a flower, will you just hold these two, two pigeons? And she holds the pigeons, he goes to pluck, pluck the flower, comes back, uh, one of the pigeons is gone, he says to her, uh, where is the pigeon? So she says, it flew away. Uh, and he says, how did it happen? So she rele releases her grip uh, and lets the other one go. And that is the end of the story for many, many people. So these legends are recounted. The other way in which um, uh, you know, history is presented is what I call in bullet points. So people say things like almost uh, coins are minted in her name, she, she issued imperial orders, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The point is, how does one give concreteness to the idea that she minted coins or that she issued imperial orders or that portraits were made in her, you know, in uh, actually actual portraits rather than by suggestion. So these are some of the ways in which uh, somebody like me would approach, a, a historian would approach the issue of evidence um, and work uh, into, a, uh, into a history. The after effects are really pretty phenomenal, as I said in one sentence when I began reading. Um, I wrote a couple of pieces um, uh, following the publication of this book uh, and the claim that she is uh, the co-sovereign, the great uh, Mughal of India, the only woman among the great Mughals uh, of India, has led to a to a rant uh, online. Um, you know, and these are people who actually don't know the history. Uh, so these are the ways in which, uh, you know, the question of evidence affects uh, my practice. Well, I'm also very interested in the truncated history um, of the tradition of miniature painting because so much of it exists in uh, storages, 
in the Western institutions as well as in, um, in collections that may yet have to be archived. So in that respect, it is very invisible. So how to give visibility to the invisible and which also easily then covers a lot of um, expunging of feminine narratives. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the interest in digging in the direction of history. Yeah, and I think uh, the same, like this idea of how do you make something um, invisible visible, right? So I think we're all going back and like looking at these histories and like finding different ways and different methods to bring them back and you know, do our thing with it. Um, but for me, like definitely working on this body of work has been about, um, you know, like not, not looking for as much as like the motherly, earthly goddesses or figures, but um, this, and also not just female figures. Like a lot of these figures that I'm like looking uh, at, they are, again, like there's like no gender, right? Like a lot of them can be read as like queer genderless. Um, and what's really interesting is that true like future interpretations of them, like if you like read um, like new translation of them or uh, interpretations of them, they have become uh, more male. Or another thing that has happened is that, you know, like in, in Farsi, for example, there's no um, feminine masculine when you, when you refer to someone as a third mm -hmm. person. Um, but when a lot of these material have become translated in, in English, they're referred to as he, uh, mm -hmm. right? While there's just this monstrous hybrid figure that in a, a Persian story is just referred to as them or it, right? So um, I think that's also something that I'm like really interested in, like going and bringing these things and this idea of reconstruction, refiguring, and interpretation at the, at the same time, but also uh, interruption of those spaces, so. Well, and I think that segues very well to another question that arose when I was sort of thinking about the three of you as, I mean, separate practices, but practices that have a lot, of, a lot in common, I think. One of the biggest differences to me, Ruby, while I was reading Empress, I think um, one of the, the piece of it that's so powerful politically is that the book butts up against simultaneously a sort of Hindu right nationalistic um, interpretation of history, um, as well as a sort of Western Orientalist Islamic patriarchy. Uh, and so in doing that, it sort of has to be an exercise in truth telling. Um, because it can't really be propagandistic because it, at the point that it becomes that, it sort of fails to do either one. Um, whereas I think, I think in Shazia and Morshin and your practices, uh, there's so often this theme of subversion, whether it's of symbols with the Hindu and the Muslim or sort of of this retelling. Um, and so I guess what I'm interested to ask is, regardless of what you call it, whether it's, I mean, playfulness or reinterpretation, what is the relationship that each of you has to, I mean, truth telling versus like, playing with the truth and doing your thing with these, I mean, with these truncated or sort of tainted histories? Um, yes, of course, as an artist, so subjective at some level, but I think that for me, it varies project to project or things gain momentum of often with time to see that how meaning um, gets uh, redetermined even in the painting that I showed. Um, also in terms of creating the work for um, the economics department. Like, that is permanent, it will be. So the, 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 the playfulness does uh, have to be centered somewhere. And that often depends on the nature of projects as well as the nature of the art world, which itself can be, <laughs> there's a, there are multiple ways of in, understanding it, you know. W often people don't talk about the relationship of money to, to art. And if we, if we want to get into that, then of course it opens up a whole bunch of uh, points to, to openly, honestly talk about. Um, I'll relate this again to the question of evidence in a really interesting way. So, you know, um, Akbar Name or Jahangir Name, the court chronicles of the great Mughal emperors, um, historians have no issue about that. They're legitimate, they're authentic, they've been produced in the court. There are, you know, it's a, it's a given. It's a text you go to to write these histories. On Noor Jahan, uh, in 1626, the most phenomenal act of her life, uh, she goes in an, on an elephant upon a roaring river and leads a battle to save Emperor Jahangir, who was taken captive by one of his noblemen. It's a hundred day of 
uh, extraordinary strategy at the end of which she is, she is able to rescue him. So there is a hundred page beautifully, a beautifully composed Masnavi uh, depicting this time uh, that, a, that a poet, a, a court poet, and somebody who had witnessed her actions writes. It's in Aligarh Muslim University. Uh, and it's called Fatnama in Noor Jahan Begum, that is the chronicle of the victory of Noor Jahan Begum. Historians have cast that aside, saying this is panegyric, right? Now, in courtly culture, what is not panegyric? So to, to kind of move into the meanings of what constitutes allegory, how is somebody imagined, um, or paintings, this is the world, you know, I was saying earlier on that this is the first woman who's painted actually, that is, uh, people have, uh, will have, painters will have witnessed her glory rather than making her into a standard beautified, uh, uh, you know, figure of Mughal paintings as with, as with other women. Uh, and there's not one painting, there are many, many paintings of, of Noor Jahan. But any number of times, the question that uh, several art historians have asked me, several have, of course, playful art historians have agreed that you know, such and such out of genre or technicality or iconography is paintings that can be attributed to her. But the questions have also been raised about, is this Noor Jahan, right? A question you would not ask if there is a question of uh, the emperor. It's a given that there, so there are, how do you ascribe meanings? In other words, who decides the status of the evidence? And in turn, who writes history? Right. Uh, so I think the truth effect, the Hindu right wing would want to wipe out anything Mughal. Right. They have wiped out Mughals, the great Mughals, from school textbooks in Maharashtra lately on the grounds that the, that the history of the region ought to be told from the point of view of Shivaji, the, the, the uh, uh, Hindu uh, you know, local leader. And what that has produced is this kind of great con contention between Muslims and Hindus, as if that was a given forever. Um, and the history I write, and that's a political position, is one of pluralism, right? Uh, and, and, you know, so, so I think it is more a matter of truth effects and who, who, who gives meaning, how you read the text, how you approach the text, right, what you discard. I have the habit of continually going after things that people habitually ignore. Uh, and I think there's something really quite extraordinary that comes out in that. Um, yeah, so I, I think um, similar to a lot of things that yeah, you both mentioned. Uh, but, you know, in comparison, let's say, to my material speculation ISIS project where I was like reconstructing um, the artifacts that were destroyed and I wanted to be as accurate as, as possible when I was like modeling them and 3D printing them. But with this work, I think I have given myself the permission to, um, you know, like think about this idea of reappropriation, refiguration as uh, something that I am choosing to do as an artist. So I'm like rewriting it. Um, but I, I would say in this work, I'm, you know, dealing with two sort of like layers of, um, resisting and fighting against systems. One is a system that these things are written and interpreted uh, by, which comes from the like very like, again, like patriarchal, um, let's say like in, in that sense, like Islamic culture. But at the same time, I'm also like dealing with another layer of it, which is um, the Western culture that like changes the stories. But at the same time, I'm trying to redefine this notion of time and space. Like I'm not interested in time that is a linear time when I tell their stories, which is, past and present and future, but like rather, you know, present, future, uh, past and present. Like that's like a notion of time that gets used, let's say, in a method uh, called Ram Mali, which tells the future in Islamic culture. So I really want to question all, all these notions, uh, things that we take for granted, um, but are ways that cultures have been colonized. Uh, for example, this notion of time that I just mentioned. Yeah, I think uh, time is really important because also I feel like time becomes the nemesis to authority. And in that respect, um, I also think purely through this medium of time and light as, as very important ideas in the work. And every project that begins that I start, it starts with a heavy amount of research. So whether it's research of actual miniature paintings or research of books and histories or trade practices, etc. It is the place where iconographies are born. 
So even in reimagining them, they are entrenched very deeply into the representations that already exist. And I think I'm hearing you say this, what I'm, what I'm immediately um, reminded of, I guess, are your works where you're dealing sort of with, with, with the grid in these very direct ways and sort of subverting the grid through, through these dotted um, motifs. Um, and I think that leads us to a very interesting conversation um, that is a much larger conversation, but I also think is very valuable to hear um, the three of your thoughts on, um, which I guess is sort of one of broader diasporic making. Um, which is the fact that Morishin had to sort of explain what is a jinn in her conversation. Uh, and a lot of Shazia's work involves, I mean, in past, you've, in your writings and stuff, it's been a lot of like, well, this is what the burak is, this is what this is. Um, and as well in the text, there's a lot of work done to sort of situate um, what is the Mughal court, where are we in history, what is happening in Europe at this moment. Um, and I think I, I would be curious to hear what your thoughts are, uh, I guess thoughts, advice to sort of younger folks in the crowd, um, myself included, on sort of how you, how you play with this rela the relationship between actually situating your own work versus just making the work and allowing it to be. Oh my God, it's a very complicated question, especially for somebody like me who's had three decades of, of, of showing work. Uh, it was very different in like the 90s was much tougher with lack of internet, et cetera, you had, there was a, you carried the burden of representing a culture unfairly. And, um, and it put incredible emphasis on you and as, as the identity. So no matter how much you were exploring the work from multiple perspectives, it was always straight-jacketed in terms of your biography, which, which I think was incredibly um, d disturbing for me for a long time. And so um, the question, so that, might be very different for a younger generation. And, and I think if, if I look at that uh, representation, I do feel that the um, excessive engagement with the other as, as, the, as, the, as representing the work itself is almost, uh, is, a, is incredibly problematic. And for that, I advise all my students to, to learn how to speak about the work, to write about the work to um, not shy away from um, taking ownership in that respect also. Mm -hmm. um, that's really interesting because something that I talk a lot um, you know, about in, in relationship to this with my you know, other like, Iranian artist friends is that this like, generation thing, right? That like, let's say Shirin Nashad who became the, the face of this like, movement coming from Iran and she had like a very specific aesthetic. And then how like we always talk about now, all of us who've moved to the US in the recent years, and it's not just one shooting in a shot anymore. It has like spread it to like many of us. And so many of us are doing amazing work. And so many of us are like owning up to this thing that we're building that is like our thing, right? Um, that is not necessarily that, that like one very specific image of how Middle East should be represented. So I think that is something that I think about a lot and like we talk about a lot how these things are like mutating and changing and also yeah. in relationship to but like you're saying. But it's problematic in the art world. It focuses in many worlds. It's like the idea of the brand, right. you know? And I, I for, for a long time, like that, that's been the, being on the periphery has always been how to, Keep changing, keep oh, evolving, of course, and always growing. Always growing. Yeah, and I would just want to add something to that. That um, I think, I don't know. For me, like it was, you know, when I moved from Iran, um, I was 23, and you know, so a, a big part of me had like shaped in Iran and 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 all that. But at the same time, when I lived in Iran, in so many ways, I I didn't feel like I belonged, and then here, I don't feel like I belong. And for for all those reasons, like I think my work. I didn't want to have like certain kind of like, let's say like aesthetic into it in a way that like I was expected, if you will, of like, oh, you're from the Middle East, you should like be, your, sh your work should be like looking this way or that way. Um, but I also wanted to build platforms, you know, and like the, the uh, and, and things that like me and my community and my people like want to talk about and want to pr present, especially at this time where we're talking about reimagining a new Middle East or, or whatever, right? So. That's the part that gets complicated. Like, how do you build these spaces? And also, how do you, how do you like, 
create a space for yourself that you don't go through that emotional labor constantly of like having to bring people into this like layer of like knowledge that I have to like explain things to in like many layers. So for me, the reading room is like a very great way of like being like, here are all these articles and material that I've gathered. And if you're interested in this work, you should spend some time here and learn about it, right? Rather than me having to give it all to you. Um, but, and also another layer of it is that right now what I care the most about is to build a library that is in Arabic and Farsi because that's the, that's the people that I want to empower the most um, and the platform that I want to build the most that I care about the most right now. Um, so yeah, that's another side of it, I guess. Um, so um, I really resist uh, categorization um, of any form. Uh, be it in personal identity, in intellectual work, uh, location. Uh, because I think, um, so I left India for graduate work um, at age 27. I taught there, um, you know, I did uh, a master's uh, in India, then I went to England, came to America, so this is where my, uh, you know, academic life began. Um, and it's been very nourishing in all kinds of locations. There's been very different kinds of debates I've been part of. So I think the history that I write has been uh, hugely informed and I think in some senses uh, opened up, uh, delineated by the engagements I've had with my feminist colleagues who are not necessarily in South Asian studies or in Islamic history. Those two, fundamentally, but also other kinds of people. So I think different homes. Uh, I continue very much to be part of debates in India, uh, you know, research um, uh, uh, all the time going back uh, incessantly. So I think, I think these, um, there is, there's no one way in some senses, right? And, and so the one thing that I've really resisted is this, this kind of form of categorization. And that, for me, the central place where I experiment that uh, is in my classrooms, right? When I, when I teach, and I think the, uh, the millennials, th there's extensions to what I do, Black Lives Matter movement, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the recent movement in Iran of taking off the hijab, uh, you know, what people's, uh, uh, you know, views are on that, uh, and so on and so forth. So it seems to me that there is a, there's a, there's a continuation, there's an extension to these, uh, to these questions, yeah. all of which in one way or another really, uh, you know, uh, help you think. And then there is, of course, the, uh, uh, the craft of writing itself, right? I mean, there's any number of uh, incredible authors the world over that I admire. Um, so it's a... It's, a, it's in this, uh, you know, this doesn't mean that it's kind of flimsy and it's everything. There's obviously intellectual traditions that I follow very closely, but um, really each time, once that, where I can resist any uh, incarceration, you know, I'm very, very deeply opposed to inca intellectual incarceration. That's this notion of pluralism, right, that we were talking about earlier, like building worlds rather than one world, and I think that's very important. Even if, you, if we come from, let's say, even the same country, but how do you build worlds rather than one yeah. thing? And also, I think for me, it's very important to, every time I make art, I want to understand who the audience is. How can the work speak over time? It has to be tested over time. How can it speak in multiple languages? How can it speak to the world? And also, I think for that, a healthy level of curiosity is very important. So that is that I would always advise for younger artists is to, you have to remain curious. So with that, I think, would you like us to move to some, so we'll move to some audience questions then. Um, so folks can just, uh, I can actually just, I can give my mic actually, because they're going to be answering. Okay, great. Then. Um, are there any questions from the audience? There's one at the back, I see. Hi, uh, thanks so much for coming to speak. Um, it's been really great. Uh, I guess this applies a little bit more to the two artists in the room and um, Obviously, there's a lot of thought that went into 
this art and actually um, I got to see you present um, last year at NYU, so that was also really great. But I've been thinking a lot recently about um, the direction that contemporary art has been going in and moving towards like a research-based art practice and how that has actually made like museums for me like an increasingly like laborious um, spectatorship exercise and I was wondering like how that factors a little bit. I, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more beyond what you've said about like the internet like rightfully shifting the burden a little bit to um, spectators and audience members but I was thinking if um, you could speak a little bit more about uh, how you feel about um, museums and where um, your research-based art might fit or might not necessarily because when, like I said, I'm sorry I'm rambling, but like spectatorship has become like an increasingly laborious exercise whenever like I go and see this, when I, when I see these things and it's just like, yeah. Um, well, in my, what, what I think is important is what is written, not the amount of what is written. So um, if there's a show on artists that are not necessarily from within the American tradition, within the Western tradition, then how is their work going to be contextualized? Often that remains a major problematic in institutions. And um, for that, you know, I'm not the curator, but I definitely feel that the that the um, that art history is behind, kind of lags behind how the work ha contemporary artists work. And um, for me, as a visual artist, I'm really interested in creating what I have to say in the actual visual work. I'm not that interested in just uh, right like. It, uh, the painting, the visual has to be compelling enough. That's, that's sort of how I take responsibility. But um, in terms of um, collaborative directions, I think that have, that have been incredibly useful, instrumental that to, to engage with other disciplines to create like a much more of a multivalent um, engagement through the arts. And I think that for that, you're not just limited to exhibit in a museum either. Um, yeah, two things. One um, is that the same, like I think when I make the visuals, like the sculpture, the video, um, the text that I write as part of the video essays, they're very easy to, you know, like sit down or like look at and spend time with. So that's one layer of it, right? That like you can just go inside the, that space and learn about the work or like have emotional connection to the work in that, sen in that way. And then as I mentioned, there's like these reading rooms and archives that I build where if you want to know more, you can spend more time on that. But the second thing is that, you know, at, at some point in my life when I like moved to the US, I like started realizing how people would ask me like, have you like seen this movie? Do you know this like this musician? And I'll be like, no, like I've never heard of this TV show. And they're like, what? How? Like I'm like, well, I don't, I, I didn't grow up here, you know. And the fact that that was expected of me constantly, this like common knowledge that I like had to know, and if I didn't, it was like weird for people. So you know, at some point, um, I started dating someone, and I would, I would told them like, um, do you know about this person? Do you know about that a Persian poem? Do you know about like, can you name me? You have to go research like ten best directors from Iran, like if you know. So sort of like I started this game of like knowledge sharing and what does it mean like where you're constantly expected to know about this dominant Western culture, and that means like if you don't know, people are like surprised. But the other way around um, is something that like people don't take into account. I mean, like, I'm not even, like, I'm talking about, like, you know, geography. Like, people don't know locations and things and the difference between Iraq and Iran and, you know. So I think part of it is also I am okay with giving people that labor and expecting them to experience yeah. it. So I think there's always going to be a level of loss. And loss is very much part of what we've been talking about today. Does anyone else have um, a question for our panel? So over here, yeah. And thank you so much for that. Hi, um, thank you so much for being here. 
Um, I'm from Lahore, Pakistan, so Shazia um, represent. But also, I wanted to ask a question. Um, so you all research, and that does like inform your work. And we do live in a world where Edward Said wrote Orientalism in 1978. So do you think that texts are still Orientalist, or that we live in a post-Orientalist world? And how does that inform your work, in terms of like, lots of work like on South Asia and the Middle East is written by the white man? I suppose that's for the historian to begin, right? Or we can collaborate, <laughs> or us to collaborate. <laughs> yes. Um, so post-colonial studies has, of course, uh, you know, Edward Said was the great um, philosopher and leader, and post-colonial scholars, post-colonial uh, feminists, feminists um, have really challenged the uh, grounds of Orientalist thinking. This doesn't mean that. Uh, there aren't spaces where Orientalist thinking pervades. Uh, sometimes completely ignorance, uh, you know, leads to... Uh, you, you, uh, Orientalism is a certain kind of phenomena. I think sometimes reactions are not even Orientalist, they're pure ignorance. So, so all of that, uh, you know, carries on. I do want to say that um, the challenge has been pretty enormous, and I think the change has been pretty enormous. Um, I'm one for constantly claiming the difference we've made. And here I want to speak as a South Asian feminist who's you know, written extensively about gender relations at the Mughal court and otherwise. Uh, and I'm also very committed to writing against pictures of victimhood. Uh, it doesn't mean that you know, um, uh, forms of terror don't take place or uh, you know, rape of women don't happen, all of those. But the point is also of extraordinary creative, creativity and inventiveness of women, right? Uh, and of course, you know, the case in point here is Noor Jahan Begum, absolutely outstanding woman, the 20th wife uh, of uh, uh, Emperor Jahangir. Uh, she was married before, had a daughter from uh, the first marriage, comes to the harem uh, as his last wife. Uh, she's not from the royal family, not like Queen Elizabeth or Cleopatra or any other Mughal woman, and rises to be the co-sovereign in technical terms, right? That surely says something about her uh, ambition, her creativity, her agency, despite what will have been confining and constricting circumstances, right? So I think it is, um, there are claims and there are counterclaims, and there's uh, you know, absolutely extraordinary work that's going on, academic, artistic, uh, you know, on the ground by the millennial generation. So, so I would claim much more of that. I also feel that once, like as an artist, if you've made work and if it has been written by, if it has been written in a certain way, it doesn't bury the work. It can be revisited. And that's also been really interesting is to see how some of the work that I did in the 90s has had a new life. And a lot of it has been um, a lot of women scholars writing about it. So. Um, we have time for one more, if you'd like, or a couple more, yeah. Let me, let me stand up. Thank you. Uh, it's been quite inspiring hearing the, all the three of you and the kind of work that is happening. I come from a world which is very different. I used to be working with UNICEF. I retired last week after 26 years. And I've just stepped in. And I've worked through some of these issues in the field. That's why I got into this in India and then lived and worked in several countries. Uh, the one thing, we worked with a lot of young people. And it's m today more than ever we feel that that reach out has to happen. So my two questions, especially to the artists, and yes, I think Noor Jahan, the work that you're doing is inspiring, and I'm definitely going to read it to understand better and reach out to a few young people myself. The question is, how do you deal with the kind of counter-narrative that kind of washes over us? The fake news, the good news, I don't know what it is, but that is inspiring and influencing younger generations to come in and make their views. So how do we use these mediums to do it in reaching to scale? That would be my question, which relates to then how do we remove the exclusivity of it in a sense? It doesn't reach everyone. So what should we do to do that? That's the big question that we ask when we work with young people. 
Well, I think it's an incredibly valid question. As an artist, it is often like troubling that, okay, how do you step outside of the art world? And for a long time, I've straddled the very uh, non-commercial career and also worked in academia, but academia is also very small. So these are very, the, then of course, I think for me, it has been different um, phases where doing more digitally based uh, video works where the work could be shared very easily across in multiple ways and also working collaboratively with other um, scholars, artists, musicians, and then there was th that reaches a bigger audience, a greater audience. So there are different ways which are pragmatic. And then, of course, there is the larger issue in terms of how do you rage against <laughs> the fake news that I think all of us are dealing with, not just the artist. The solution doesn't lie in one field. Um. I guess each to his own. I decided to um, do creative nonfiction uh, for Noor Jahan uh, while keeping intact, um, you know, the concerns that I've been outlining here about uh, evidence, the approach, uh, you know, taking on certain kind of political agendas and so on and so forth. But really, uh, essentially, uh, doing a bold and beautiful story, if you will. So this. Uh, a book is also going to come out by Penguin in India and Pakistan. And they asked me to write a piece for Vogue India. And I said, um, you know, why Vogue India? And they said, because millennials are reading it, can't you just write a piece that says, Noor Jahan, the feminist icon? And we did, and it's been wonderful. And there's been modern recasting of all these images and you know, the story is getting picked up essentially by a whole range of wonderful women. Uh, and, and I'm hoping men. Uh, but uh, so those are some of the ways in which, I mean, it's not automatic. There are, there are practices you are really deeply entrenched in, the technicalities you understand really well. And so, so writing this book was, um, you know, painful and generative in, in ways in which uh, you know, it freed me. It freed me so that I could take my concerns uh, to a wider intellectual audience and not assume the audience itself, right? Uh, so those are the experimentations I've been doing. Yeah, so a couple of different things. One is working on, you know, like digital media, um, having like a certain presence on social media, uh, which goes really far, you know, like your work can be seen and things you say can be like shared and thought about, etc. Um, the second one for me is this thing that is art activism, right? I've always thought about my practice, not just as an artist and my background, my bachelor's was in um, social studies and, and media theory. Uh, so I come from a background, but that was not traditional art background also. Um, and how you can bring these two worlds of activism and, and art together. And uh, there are like many different methods that I like practice when I make art. One is like, again, like um, open access ways of sharing knowledge, um, building archives, um, doing these like sort of panels that are not just like panels, but more of like casual sit down sessions to, like, to, to expand and like talk about issues. Um, but also I travel a lot giving a lot of talks in, in universities. Um, and I do like a lot of workshops and it's like really interesting. How does that make like, and like you can, you can see like their eyes of the students sort of being like, oh, I had never like thought about like, like I talk about this concept, which is digital colonialism in relationship to uh, reconstruction and, you know, shared heritage. And so many times I've, I've gone and like talk about this stuff and the students have come to me and they're like, I've never like thought about this before. I, or like, this is something that I had like never like thought about, like thinking in my work, etc. So I think going beyond art uh, for art's sake and art practice, that's been like really important for me, how you can engage people, how you can build community, like literally building community from an, 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 an art project. Um, and with, like, let's say, she who sees the unknown that I was talking about, building a space and language that doesn't really exist. Uh, so, like, a lot of this work will be taking the shape of, let's say, sci-fi writing, which does not science fiction does not really exist in Iran. Like, I didn't grow up with science fiction as a genre, right? So, 
these, these little practices. And I really, really believe in how you can uh, think about micro actions as ways that you can make macro influences. And I think that's possible. I think teaching really is important. Art is not just the making of an object. I think l teaching creativity has to start really early. And if there can be creative ways of injecting that, how to teach that to young people, to, to children, is very, very critical. How to think of art as a problem-solving idea, not just as an as a art-making object. Yeah, well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, everyone, for uh, attending. And I think in the back there are some drinks as well as um, one of Shadia, Shazia's books and um, Ruby's book for purchase. Um, so thank you all so much. Thank you.